welcome to our unit on complex analysis. In this video, we'll be exploring functions of complex numbers and some of their key properties. Much of this video is adapted from Visual Complex Analysis by Tristam Needham. I highly recommend you check this book out for a deeper dive into complex analysis. We can imagine the complex plane like a regular Euclidean plane, where the real numbers are along the x direction and the imaginary numbers are along the y direction. This means that anything we can do with linear algebra, or for that matter, planar geometry, can be implemented on the complex plane. For instance, complex numbers can be represented in polar coordinates, where the magnitude is the length of the vector and the argument is the angle with respect to the x-axis. The complex conjugate of a point z equals x plus iy is z bar, which equals x minus iy. You can think about this as a reflection about the real axis. We can think of complex functions as maps from the complex plane to the complex plane. We'll take the left coordinate system to be our domain with complex coordinates z equals x plus iy, and the target space, our second copy of the complex plane, is on the right. It has coordinates w equals u plus iv. This is an example of applying the map z goes to z times 1 plus i root 3. Let's think about this map in two different ways. First, we can think about this as a pair of functions, x goes to x minus root 3y and y goes to y plus root 3x. Or we can think about this transformation in polar coordinates. z goes to z times 1 plus i root 3 equals 2z times e to the i pi on 3. If we think about z in its polar form, then the transformation we just worked out, f of z equals 2r times e to the i theta plus pi on 3 is a global rescaling by 2 combined with a rotation by pi over 3. We can use this to think about what happens when our map is some power z to the n equals r to the n e to the i n theta. In general, this stretches the radial coordinate by r to the n and the theta coordinate by n times theta. We shouldn't think of these maps as just acting on an object in the w plane. We should think of this as a transformation of the whole plane. Here is an example for z goes to z squared divided by 5 so that it fits on the screen. This creates a double cover of the complex plane. Note that both points 1 and minus 1 get mapped to 1. Here's another version of this map. I've drawn it in two ways. The plane is the polar version of the animation I just showed, but there is another version of it illustrated in 3D. Here the height maps the magnitude of the R transformation at different points, and the color is the argument of the domain. You can see that the disk wraps over itself twice. Now that we understand how powers act on the complex plane, we can start defining more complex functions using power series. We're used to thinking of Taylor series as a way of describing real functions. f of x equals c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared, etc. equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of cn times x to the n. This converges in some range minus a is less than x is less than a. The series I'm showing here is centered at the origin, but in general, the series can be centered at any value. We can use the power series to extend functions from the real line to the complex plane. f of z is equal to c0 plus c1z plus c2z squared, etc., which equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of cn z to the n, is the generalization of f of x to the complex plane. I claim that this power series converges for some radius r. Let's consider the partial sum fk of z equals the sum from n equals 0 to k of cn z to the n. We're trying to evaluate f at some complex point a. We can show that the power series converges to f of a if there exists an integer m such that the absolute value of f of a minus fk of a is less than some positive number epsilon, no matter how small, for all k greater than m. The radius of convergence is given by the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of cn divided by the absolute value of cn plus 1. This means that the function f of z can be arbitrarily well approximated by the polynomial fn of z within a disk given by the absolute value of z is less than r. 
Consider a real function that can be expressed as a convergent power series for some interval in the real line, f of x equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of c n x to the n. The complex power series f of z equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of c n z to the n with the same coefficient c is the unique extension of f of x to the complex plane that a converges to f of x along the real line and b can be represented by a power series in z. We'll use this notion to explore several familiar functions. For example, the exponential function is given by e to the z equals 1 plus z plus z squared on 2 factorial plus z cubed on 3 factorial, etc., which equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of z to the n divided by n factorial. Here is a chunk of the complex plane centered at the origin. The dashed line is the imaginary axis, and the imaginary part doesn't quite extend from minus i pi to i pi. Here are some straight lines on the domain that we can use to show the mapping. This is the mapping of the complex plane under the map z goes to e to the z. We can understand the geometry of this mapping using Euler's formula, e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. This tells us that e to the z equals e to the x times cosine y plus i sine y. So the real coordinate gets mapped to the radial coordinate scaled by e to the x, and the imaginary coordinate plays the part of an angle. This map wraps over the complex plane an infinite number of times. Every line given by the imaginary part of z equals a constant maps to a ray, and every purely imaginary line maps to the arc of a circle. Each of the colored straight lines we started with maps to a log spiral. Let's use what we've just learned about the complex exponential function to understand the complex trig functions sine z and cosine z. Sine z equals 1 on 2i times e to the iz minus e to the minus iz, which equals sine x cosh y plus i cos x sinh y. First off, we're looking at e to the iz rather than e to the z, so this extra factor of i acts like a rotation by pi on 2. So the domain I'm going to pick to show the transformation runs from nearly minus pi to pi in the real direction and from minus i to i in the imaginary direction. Lines of constant imaginary value, for example, e to the x equals i times a, are mapped to ellipses with semi-major axis cosh a and semi-minor axis sinh a. The lines at x equals plus or minus pi get mapped to the imaginary axis, and lines of constant real value, for instance, z equals a plus i y, are mapped to hyperbole. Similarly, cosine z equals one half e to the iz plus e to the minus iz, which equals cos x cosh y minus i sine x sinh y. As with a complex sine function, lines of constant imaginary value are mapped to ellipses and lines of constant real value are mapped to hyperbole. However, here the real axis gets mapped back to the real axis and the imaginary axis gets mapped to the point z equals 1. Likewise, the lines at x equals plus or minus pi get mapped to z equals minus 1. Next, let's take a look at the complex functions f of z equals 1 over 1 minus z squared and g of z equals 1 over 1 plus z squared. Let's look at the expansions for both around the point z equals 0. f of z equals 1 plus z squared plus z to the fourth, etc., which equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of z to the 2n. Since the coefficients of this series are 1 for all values of n, the radius of convergence is 1. The expansion for g of z is 1 minus z squared plus z to the fourth, etc., which equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n times z to the 2n. The radius of convergence for this series is also 1. f of x and g of x behave quite differently along the real line, but they have the same radius of convergence. So let's see if we can understand what's going on with that. We can expand f of z as 1 over 1 minus z times 1 over 1 plus z, which we can rewrite using partial fractions as 1 half divided by 1 minus z plus 1 half divided by 1 plus z. Here is a plot of the absolute value of f of z equals c for several values of c. This type of plot is called a contour plot. The color becomes more yellow as the value of c increases. f of z has singularities at z equals plus or minus 1. Likewise, g of z equals 
1 over z minus i times 1 over z plus i, which can be written as i over 2 divided by i minus z plus i over 2 divided by i plus z. Here is a contour plot of the absolute value of g of z. Although the real versions of f of x and g of x don't look very similar, we can see that they are related to one another by a rotation by pi over 2 in the complex plane. g of z has singularities at z equals plus or minus 1. We call these singularities poles. The radius of convergence of f of z and g of z is just the distance to the nearest pole. Imagine we have a function f of z where f of z naught equals zero, then the reciprocal of f, one over f, diverges at z equals z naught. We call z naught a zero of f and z naught a pole of one over f. There almost always exists some integer n such that z minus z naught to the n times f of z is finite and non-zero in the neighborhood of z naught. If n is greater than zero, then z naught is a pole of order n. Likewise, if n is less than zero, then z naught is a zero of order the absolute value of n. If no n exists that satisfies z minus z naught to the n times f of z is finite and non-zero, then we call z naught an essential singularity. Note, we often use the terms simple zero and simple pole to describe zeros and poles of order one. In the neighborhood of z0, we can expand the function f in a Laurent series, which is like a Taylor series, but we're allowed to keep negative powers. f of z equals the sum from j is greater than minus n of cj z minus z0 to the j, where n is an integer and the coefficient c minus n is non-zero. If z0 is a pole of order n, then the sum starts at j equals minus the absolute value of n. Going back to our examples, let's look at g of z in the neighborhood of one of its singularities, z equals i. Using the partial fraction representation of g of z, z minus i to the n times g of z equals i over 2 when n equals 1. This means that g of z has a simple pole at z equals i. Then the principal part of the Laurent series, which is the part with the negative power, is i over 2 divided by i minus z. For the rest of the Laurent series, we can expand i over 2 divided by i plus z about z equals i. Then the Laurent series for g of z about z equals i is g of z equals i over 2 divided by i minus z plus 1 fourth plus i over 8 times z minus i minus 1 16th times z minus i squared, etc., which equals the sum from j equals minus 1 to infinity of 1 fourth times i over 2 to the j times z minus i to the j. This series has a radius of convergence of 2, which is the distance to the other pole at z equals minus i. So far, our example functions have assigned a single value to each value of z. For some functions, we might want to be able to assign multiple values to each z. This may sound a bit strange, but it's something we've seen in real functions. For example, consider the function f equals sine x and f inverse equals arc sine of x. If f of 0 equals f of pi equals f of n pi equals 0, then which one do we assign to arc sine of 0? It turns out that there is a unique way to resolve this for complex functions. Let's consider complex roots. We'll start with the cube root as an example. We showed before that the map z squared gives a double cover of the complex plane. Likewise, z cubed gives a triple cover of the complex plane. Here, the points z equals 1, z equals 2 pi i on 3, and z equals e to the 4 pi i on 3 all get mapped to 1. So when we invert the map, which value does the cube root of 1 get mapped to? Here's the map z goes to z cubed. You'll see that the complex plane seems to only get mapped to one third of the plane. So it seems like only one third of the values are accessible by this map. In general, for almost every point z, f of z equals the cube root of z can correspond to three different values. For example, the point z equals one can be mapped to one e to the two pi i on three and e to the four pi i on three. So why do we have to pick just one of these for f of one to get mapped to? We call functions like f of z equals the cube root of z multi-valued functions, or multifunctions, and we keep track of all values that each z gets mapped to. 
Here's another view of the plot of the cube root of z. Instead of mapping the complex plane to itself, the x and y values are the real and imaginary components of c, respectively, and the z value is the argument of the cube root of z. I would need four-dimensional space to plot the whole complex map as a height function, but plotting the argument is a good choice because we know that the magnitude of z, which equals r to the one-third, is well-behaved for all r. The interesting part happens in the argument, then. As you can see, there are three branches or sheets that correspond to different values of z. If I wanted to get from one value on one branch to another value on another branch, I have to walk all the way around the origin. The origin is a place where all three branches are glued together. We call such a point a branch point. When we draw complex maps in 2D in the complex plane, we often draw in branch cuts, which are arbitrary lines that start at a branch point and go out to infinity. These illustrate that the function is multivalued and that to get from one branch to the other, you must travel around the branch point. The example of the cube root of z has three branch cuts, denoting that we can switch between each of three branches. If a multi-valued complex function can be expressed as a power series about some point z equals a, then the radius of convergence of this series is the distance from a to the nearest branch point. Here is another example. This one has two branch points. f of z equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus z squared. This plot shows the argument as a height function. f of z has branch points at z equals plus or minus 1. This function can be drawn as having branch cuts going from each of the branch points out to infinity. In this height function representation of the argument, the branch cuts are the places where the argument is discontinuous. Lastly, we'll look at the complex logarithm. We show that the complex exponential maps intervals of length 2 pi i to circular regions. Since there are infinitely many intervals along the line z equals a plus i y for any value of a, the complex exponential covers the complex plane infinitely many times. This means that the complex logarithm has infinitely many values for almost any z. If e to the z equals e to the r e to the i theta, we can think of the complex logarithm as the inverse of this. Log z equals log r e to the i theta, which equals log r plus i times theta, equals log of the absolute value of z plus i times the argument of z. This is a plot of part of log z. This shows four branches. So the value of log z on each of the branches differs by 2 pi times some integer n. It's often impractical to think of the whole complex logarithm this way, so sometimes we consider just what we call the principal branch, for which the domain contains only the horizontal strip z equals x plus i y, where minus pi is less than y is less than pi. So the principal branch denoted log with a capital L is equal to log of the absolute value of z plus i times the argument with a capital A z on this domain. This is a single valued function. To make this function single valued, we've had to sacrifice continuity along some line. In this plot, log of z is discontinuous along the line z equals x for x is greater than zero. Sometimes this line of discontinuities is called the branch cut of the logarithm. Every time we cross this branch cut going anti-clockwise, we move to a branch that is 2 pi i greater than the branch that we are currently on. And every time we cross it going clockwise, we switch to the branch that is 2 pi i less than our current branch. Lastly, note that the log of z equals zero is an essential singularity. Since there is no power of z, we can multiply it by to make it a finite non-zero quantity. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.